Hi Dan here, Scooter Magazine. Right, today we're going to talk about gearing for both Vespa and Lambretta scooters. Individual owners might be more familiar with their own setups, but there are a tremendous amount of similarities between the two. So in both cases, you're going to have the spark at the top end, driving the piston down and back up, and giving you one full rotation of the crank. Now in both cases, you will have a flywheel on one side of the crank, and a sprocket, or a cog, on the other. On a Vespa it will be a cog, which is part of the clutch. On a Lambretta it will be an independent sprocket. In both cases, they drive a larger cog or sprocket. On the Vespa, they directly mesh together. The smaller cog drives the larger cog of the primary drivetrain. On the Lambretta, the smaller cog drives, sorry, smaller sprocket drives a larger sprocket but they're connected via a chain. So in both cases it's the crank, the smaller sprocket or cog, driving the larger sprocket or cog and that in both cases is connected to a smaller four-speed gearbox Christmas tree and those are your four gears one two three and four. Those four gears are then directly meshed to four loose gears and it's these the combination of each two which provides your ratios for gears one, two, three and four and then thus your final drive ratio. That is then your, connected to your lay shaft which has your back wheel on it. So the drivetrain runs through from crank to small sprocket to large sprocket to uh, Christmas tree to loose gear drive shaft wheel. When you're selecting your gearing you've got a few considerations to uh, take into account. Mainly power and load. In terms of power that refers to your engine peak power as well as its spread of power. In which case one guy might have 20 horsepower but a very narrow peak. Another guy might have 18 horsepower but a broader spread. So you would find for gearing purposes that the wide spread of 18 horsepower is better than the narrow peak of 20. And I'll explain why when we look on the dyno software in a minute. Power aside, load is the other major consideration. And so you're gonna to have to look at two things. One is the frontal area of the scooter, whereby a very unaerodynamic Series 2 Lambretta versus a more aerodynamic small frame Vespa or cut down, cut down Lambretta with Vega leg shields, the two frontal areas are going to have a big impact on gearing further up the rev range as speed increases and then wind resistance starts to become an important factor. Um, by that, uh, a good demonstration would be it only takes on a, on a normal full bodied scooter uh, with an average rider of average height and weight, it would only take around 9 to 10 horsepower to reach 60 miles an hour. Okay, if you want to increase your speed by around a third, by around 33%, you don't need a 33 increase, 33% increase in, in power, you need a, a probably a 100% increase in power. So you can get to 60 mile an hour with as little as nine or 10, but to get to 80 mile an hour, you now need around 18 to 20 horsepower. Um, to go on again with just a 25% increase in speed to take you up to 100 mile an hour, you now need to go up to around the 34 horsepower mark. So having the power to pull the gearing is incredibly important but as is the spread of power to change between the gears so that you don't drop out of the power when you're changing gear at those crucial moments as the air resistance curve increases with speed that becomes more important so a guy who sort of travels everywhere at around 60 mile an hour he can get away with a crappy gearbox with loads of big gaps in it especially if he's got a clubman on with a broad spread of power once you start increasing the horsepower um, and perhaps making your range of power narrower, um, you're going to fall into a situation which I'll explain on the dyno where potentially you go up to 20 or 21 horsepower or more, change gear and then drop out of the power. Now low down in speed where there's minimal wind resistance, that's not so much of a problem. 
When you get up to 60, 70, 80 mile an hour plus, that does become a problem and that's often why you see riders knocking backwards and forwards between third and fourth and can't quite get the thing to pull properly because they've either got the wrong gap between the gears or the wrong overall final drive ratio. The other thing in terms of load that you need to consider, and I'm sorry to say it, is you and your passenger. So a guy who is perhaps 10 stone, five foot six, solo rider, no luggage, on a cut down Lambretta or small frame Vespa will have less concerns about his, his gearing ratios and final drives than somebody who's perhaps six foot four, 18 stone, has a wife who's 5'10", 15 stone, has got a bunch of luggage on there. Even the geography of where you live, somebody who lives in a hilly area and having to pull up steep hills with pillions and passengers and uh, luggage and stuff like that, can have a huge impact. So you've got to be realistic about what you're going to pull. And so the guy who's the little racing snake at 10 stone or whatever, 11 stone, five foot six, on a cut down scooter with minimal frontal area, he might be able to pull 70 mile an hour with um, a specific meager setup of engine. You take that engine out of his scooter and transplant it straight into your series two with a couple of 18 and 14, 15 stone passengers and, and uh, passenger and, and luggage, that engine might not pull it. In fact, more than likely, it won't. Um, and if you are gonna get it to pull it, you might have to change the gearing vastly in order to accommodate the extra load. So power and load are two of the biggest considerations that you've got to think about when you're selecting your gearing. The next item is the ratio gap. So that's the gap between each gear. And different gearboxes have different gaps. And as I said earlier, if you're going to run a low speed scooter at 50, 60 mile an hour, and you've got a broad spread of power, you can get away with some crappy gearboxes, like VJ Mark II gearboxes in Lambrettas, for example. Um, if you start running some of the higher power and higher speeds, you've got to become more aware of the gaps between the gears, and we will take a look on the dyno in a minute, have a look at some charts of different gearboxes and see what the gaps are between different gearboxes and explain how one particular gearbox might be problematic between these gears, whereas another might be problematic between those. And then the last thing to consider after we've looked at the dyno will be um, final drive ratios. Now, people often hear these quoted and um, you might hear somebody says, oh, I've got a final drive ratio of 5.2. What does that mean? Basically all it means is that for every 5.2 revolutions of the crankshaft, your rear wheel will turn once. So if somebody changes the gearing and they change their final drive ratio to 4.8, now the crank only needs to rotate 4.8 times in order to turn the back wheel once. Therefore that for person over the same amount of RPM will travel faster. So those are the basic fundamentals of what, how your gearbox works, the consideration you need to take in terms of power and load, some of the horsepower marks in terms of hitting certain speeds, the ratio gaps between each gear as you drop in and out of the gearbox, and the final drive ratio, which is what your scooter has to pull. So if we look on the dyno, and I give you some examples of that, um, it should become a little bit more clear. Right, we're on the dyno, and what we're looking at here, first of all, in this red curve is an Italian Li150 gearbox. Um, you can see quite clearly it's bouncing through gears one, two, three, and four. You can see also that the gears are fairly evenly spaced. So this would suit an engine which has a nice broad spread of power and this will give great results both at low speeds around town and out on the open road. So nice even spacing between one, two, and three for low speeds, and nice um, even spacing for two and, uh, sorry, for three and four when out on the open road. Because when you get out on the open road, wind resistance, the curve increases exponentially, and once you start going above 60 mile an hour, um, the power requirements are greater. So if you have a gearbox which constantly drops out of the power between gear changes, then you need a broad spread of power to make sure that gap is bridged. Conversely, if you don't have a broad spread of power and you're finding that when you're out on the open road, you're going from third to fourth and it's not pulling, 
Um, what you can do is fit uh, an Indian GP200 gearbox. So again, the spacings between one and two are fairly similar. It has a larger gap between two and three, but then a closer gap between three and four. So round town here in gears one and two, very similar to the Li150, but between two and three, there is a price to pay. And that price is, is if you're traveling at a speed where you're in you know, um, a steady flow of traffic and you're trying to, um, second gear could start revving too high, you change gear, and then third gear could be revving too, too low, it's balking, and you can end up at certain speeds knocking up and down between the two, which can be irritating. But then the price you know, of paying that is offset because when you get out on the open road, if your, meet, if your motor was peaky and not performing between gears three and four, this, these two are almost stuck together. This three and four are so close, close on an Indian GP200 gearbox, they almost form one gear. The difference between them is, is so slight. It's, it, it, and it helps you change from third to fourth when wind resistance out on the road is a factor and for you to not drop out of the power if your motor is peaky. But like I say, if you've got um, an engine which has got a broad spread of power, then the Li150 gearbox is more evenly spread. What you can also do, if, if money is no object, you can get a five speed gearbox. And so you'll see here, down in the lower gears where wind resistance isn't a problem, gears one and two evenly spaced. Less of a gap between two and three than there is on the Indian GP200 gearbox, probably fairly similar to the Li150 spacing, but then you've got the benefit of very close spacing between three and four, and even closer between four and five. So as wind resistance increases, the five-speed gearbox cuts out the problem of dropping out of your power range between gears. Um, but as I say, if you have an engine which has a broad spread of power, then the five-speed gearbox is, is a luxury and not a necessity. Um, if you've got a broad spread of power, then the, uh, the Li150 gearbox there is perfectly ample. If you look at a Vespa, one of the troublesome motors is always the P P200. And this is a P200 here. And contrary to popular belief, the gearing ratios are actually fairly evenly spaced. People think that there's a huge gap between third and fourth on a P200 Vespa. It isn't that it's a huge gap. It's that the final drive ratio is very low to begin with. On a Vespa P200, it's something, I'm going off memory here, but it's something like 4.6, which for a little nine and a half horsepower 200, it's quite a low ratio. So if you're on a flat surface with a single rider, you can chug along, but once you hit a hill or a headwind or have a pillion on, this fourth gear can struggle on a P200. And even more so if you then fit the peaky Molossi kits and drop it into fourth with 4.6 and it won't pull it. And that's when people drop in the, um, the Vespa T5 um, fourth gear to reduce this gap from, and it's, it only takes it up slightly from a 4.6 to I think to a 4.7. If you compare that to the um, T5 and the PX125 gearboxes, which I forget, but I'm sure there's something like 5.6 final ratio. They're revy little gearboxes, but they can also be tamed by changing the, um, the small sprocket on the clutch and, and bringing them more into line around the five region. But um, either way, the, the, the spacings of the P200 are quite ample, but it's just a very low final drive ratio, which can need adjustment very, very often. Um, but if you have a torquey motor, like say a Polini touring kit with a SIP you know, road to exhaust or a Panasco kit with a BGM big box or something like that, that will pull P200 gearing all day long and will make for a fabulous mile munching cruising machine because of this low um, drive ratio here of 4.6 in fourth gear. So that gives you a visual display of how different gearboxes have different gaps. Um, the P2 there being fairly evenly spaced, the um, five-speed gearbox being all things to all people, the um, Italian GP200, sorry, the Indian GP200 um, having a very close third and fourth, but a larger second and third. And then finally, the Italian Li150 and also the Italian GP200 gearbox is very similar in this respect, in terms of its even spacings between the ratios. So pick the right gearbox for the right motor. PQ1s often need closer ratios on third and fourth, broad spread of power, 
more even spacings are beneficial. Back to the workshop. Right, that's all for today. I hope you've enjoyed the video. I hope you've got some worth out of it. Um, I'm hoping to answer some of the questions that other people have asked about port timings in the next video, but that unfortunately is probably even a more complicated um, conversation to have than this one was, and I found this one tricky enough trying to convey uh, the knowledge in a simplified manner as best I could. But I hope you've enjoyed it. Keep an eye out for the next video.